Hi, John Hess here from Filmmaker IQ, your indefatigable supporter of 24 FPS. At least that's how YouTube algorithm has apparently labeled me. Now seriously, I didn't think my last video where I reviewed Gemini Man both in high frame rate and in standard 24 would blow up like it did. And as a result, I was assaulted with comments, some very positive and supportive, but some spouting new and strange myths about high frame rate and 24 frames per second that I haven't heard before, but I do think they need to be addressed. Fear not, this will not be a video of straw man bashing because as we address these false conjectures, we'll get to explore some interesting facets of filmmaking history. Now let me first establish the basic tenements of my argument as quickly and as briefly as I can. I've been discussing this topic first in my history of frame rate video, then in my defense of 24 FPS, links in the description for these and all the other videos I will discuss today. Now first, I acknowledge that 24 frames per second is a completely arbitrary number invented in the sound era, but that frame rate does carry aesthetic properties that have become associated with cinematic film, especially when television, which had its own unique and higher frame rate came around. Now, secondly, my discussion on frame rates is limited to the cinema only. I am not addressing video games or VR or sports broadcasts, all of which I'm a firm believer can utilize high frame rates. I'm talking specifically live action narrative feature films and excluding 3D from the conversation as I believe that the real HFR application might actually be in the realm of 3D. Third, and most importantly, high frame rate is not a new technology in the capture of motion picture. New technology only allows us to capture larger digital images in high frame rate, but high frame rate itself has been viewable to consumers since the earliest days of television. 60i in NTSC is much closer to the 60 FPS experience than it is to the 30p, which I explore in my video on interlacing. So the conclusion is that the complete dominance of 24 frames per second in film, it's all but a, just a handful of recent films, creates an unbreakable feedback loop. If you are so inspired to make movies for a living, it is because you were inspired by the movies you watched, all of which were screened at 24 frames per second. When you go to make a movie, if it is not 24 FPS, it will not look right. The focus is on filmmakers because after all, they are the ones who make the films. And if you can't get filmmakers to supply high rate films, there is no breaking up that feedback loop. A simple graph comparing all the high frame rate movies in recent years to all the 24 FPS movies released in new theaters in the United States and Canada is all you really need to see that high frame rates is all but dead in cinema. And this graph only shows the theatrical movies, Never mind the narrative TV shows, both broadcast and streaming that are using 24 frames per second. Now, despite these rather apparent facts, I get comments every day saying 24 FPS needs to die. And HFR is just the next natural step for the cinema. The pushback from old stogies like me are just echoes of the pushback that other advancements in film technology have experienced. A high frame rate will ultimately prevail and John, you'll be sorry you stood in their way. Now, I don't always control my snark and disdain in my comment responses because they are, after all, just people of the internet, the common clay of the New West, you know, morons. But I will try to keep the snark to a minimum in this video as we explore a few of these analogy conjectures that I am constantly getting and why they fail the reality test. Analogy conjecture number one. The rejection of high frame rates is just like the backlash that occurred when color took over black and white movies. I have heard this dozens of different ways, including why don't you go back making movies in black and white, you old man? The problem here is that movies were always in color. First, let's be very clear. Our relationship to the moving picture as entertainment, media, and art is very, very different than the relationship that our great-great-grandparents had to their media at the turn of the 19th century. This is what makes discussing proto-film, the very first moving images from the late 1890s to the mid-1910s, kind of difficult to comprehend. You need to step outside your own existence and imagine a world 
before we got accustomed to staring at screens for 90% of our waking hours. But back to the color point. The thing is color and black and white film have coexisted since the very beginning of film. Here is Edison's 1895 short film, The Serpentine Dance. The film was hand tinted by an artist that went through frame by frame coloring in the film with a brush. Going a few more years ahead when films became a little more narrative, but not quite the features that we think of today, here are several examples of Georges Méliès from 1902 to 1909. Jumping ahead to the mid-teens, we start seeing the first feature-length silent films. Films were often tinted and toned depending on the mood. Red, blue, yellow, as you see in D.W. Griffith's Intolerance. Then by 1922, you have the first natural color processes, Technicolor two strip in the toll of the sea. It was such a success that labs couldn't print the film fast enough. Directors flooded Technicolor's office wanting to make their films in this process. Demand for the process ultimately sank Technicolor as they couldn't maintain quality control. But they came back with 1935's Becky Sharp that brought a new process of Technicolor 3 strip that gave us the color that we're familiar with in the greatest epics of the golden era, Gone with the Wind, Wizard of Oz, and Robin Hood, just to name a few. For economic reasons, color being more expensive to produce, color didn't take over a majority of the films until the mid 60s when a new Eastman color, a single strip color film format was produced. In fact, 1966, would be the last year that the Academy stopped giving separate awards for best cinematography in black and white and in color. The point is, at no time was there ever a popular backlash against color. Again, remember that in these developmental years, film was considered an amusement. It wasn't even protected as free speech in the United States. It was far from considered art. Later down the line, sure, maybe you had one or two filmmakers that eschewed the use of color for artistic reasons. You have filmmakers today that like to experiment with black and white, but the industry itself never rejected color and the steady growth of color through the years looks nothing like the non-starter that high frame rate is today. Analogy conjecture number two. The rejection of HFR is like the initial rejection of sound at the movies. As I stated earlier, it's hard to discuss proto-film because it was a relationship so radically different than today. To me, the silent era from 1914 to 1927 is almost as alien. First is the misnomer in the word silent. No one watched silent films during this time period in silence. They were always accompanied with live musical performances. But the idea of marrying synchronized sound and motion picture actually goes back again to Thomas Edison with the kinetophone in the mid 1910s. If I find the young man who wrote after my name, a merry old soul is he. He'll have cause to be sorry he ever became a writer of history. If I find the young man who wrote after my name, a merry old soul is he. He'll have cause to be sorry he ever became a writer of history. A writer of history. The real problem with sound in cinema was not necessarily recording it, it was how to project it so it was loud enough in a theater hall. Well, that issue didn't get solved until the mid 20s and the first thing they'd try to do with that technology is replace the live musicians in the theaters. In fact, it was really more of a fluke when Al Jolson spoke for the first time in The Jazz Singer in 1927. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. And people loved it. The marriage of sound and the movies was when the movies, as we recognize it today, really began. I mean, I could show you a movie from 1935, and sure, the acting style and the dress might look a little bit different, but it feels like a movie to today's sensibilities. If I had to show you a, an earlier silent film, it's obvious that something is a little different, something a little more primitive. Now, because sound was so incredibly popular, in just a matter of two short years, the entire industry was retooled from top to bottom. Everybody got on board the sound business. And luckily, the change happened quickly, as 1929 would bring the end of easy financing options. Now, you will hear that there was some backlash here, as cameras needed to be buried inside big soundproof booths. The visual style that silent films had cultivated with free moving cameras became stifled with the realities of recording sound. The difference, however, is that sound was, again, 
a massive hit and again supported enthusiastically by the industry. Incidentally, sound ushered in the regulated film speed of 24 frames per second because sound needed a consistent, reliable frame rate to maintain sync and audio consistency. Analogy condition number three, the rejection of HFR is like the transition from standard definition to high definition. This conjecture, I actually have some firsthand knowledge of. First, let's dispel the myth that old movies were shot in standard definition. They were shot on film and you can scan film to some incredibly high resolutions. A lot of the work being done on restoring old films begins with a 4K scan. So resolution, was never an issue with cinema at all. Case closed. But what people are getting at is the transition from standard definition to high definition in broadcast television that occurred in the early to mid 2000s. The stories go that news stations had to redo their entire sets as they looked cheap and the makeup artists had to relearn their craft as HD showed off every imperfection in the skin. Well, as someone that worked professionally during this time period, let me set the record straight. Yes, there was some growing pains in the transition to HD, but the most exaggerated parts are due to the inadequacies of early HD cameras, not that you had to shoot HD that differently than the way you shot SD. I know because honestly, other than just watching my focus more carefully, I didn't do anything when I transitioned from SD to HD. I did transition a little later as I'm frugal and I don't like to pay the early adopter tax. And I generally shot on locations, but by the time I got an HD camera, most of the kinks were already worked out. Skin tone handling and sharpness were pretty good when I finally got on board. There was nothing extra special I had to do with the makeup. Now, to throw another wrench into the conjecture, this transition between SD and HD was done at high frame rates, 60 frames per second, be it the 720 60p standard or the 1080 60i standard. So comparisons to shifting frame rates don't really make sense. Analogy conjecture number four, the pushback to HFR is like the pushback in the transition from film to digital. Now, standing here at the close of 2009, I can pretty safely say that the dividing line between film and digital is all but gone. At the highest end of movie production, you have cinematographers shooting with film and you have cinematographers shooting with digital and that's perfectly fine. It's an aesthetic choice. On the lower end of film production, it's mostly digital. It took a long time to get digital to get accepted. And again, I speak from firsthand knowledge as I have always been firmly in the digital camp. But what did digital need to do to prove itself worthy? It needed to emulate the look of film. We needed sensors that match the size of the film gate. We needed the kind of color rendition that film gave us. And yes, we needed 24 FPS. I hit this topic harder in my first defense of 24 FPS. We've been shooting video at 60 Hertz in the United States since 1950. It wasn't until 1997 that we get the first digital cinema camera. And in the 2000s until we had a consumer camera capable of shooting 24 frames per second. Video had to catch up. Analogy conjecture number five. They're saying the same thing about 4K. I recently read this one and frankly, no one is seriously rejecting 4K the way that we're rejecting high frame rates. What some cinematographers are questioning is the limit of how much resolution can give us in terms of a quality image. But there is no real aesthetic backlash to 4K in the image acquisition realm. Now for viewing 4K, there is a factor that can't be ignored, viewing distance. As you get further away from the screen, your eyes won't be able to resolve the 4K image. So the effects of high resolution can be countered by distance, but the same cannot be said for the look of high frame rate. Analogy conjecture number six. The discussion between 24 FPS and HFR is like the discussion between vinyl and digital. I don't wanna spend that much time on this one because my ears simply aren't good enough to always pick up the difference. Now that can't be said of 24 frames per second. I can always tell the difference. A small study has shown that you only need to go up to 26 frames per second in order for about 75% of subjects to notice a difference. So all my European friends relax when I'm talking about 24 frames per second, I'm including you guys with your 25 FPS. 
The fact is the psychophysics of how our brains respond to sight and sound is so vastly different that you can't make a true and accurate comparison. In fact, there are more neurons connected to the retina of our eyes than connected to our sensory organs of sound, touch, taste, and smell combined. So the way these things play out visually in our brains is totally different than any other sense. But if you held me at gunpoint and demanded that I draw a vinyl digital analogy, I would say that digital is more like watching a TV with the sharpness turned all the way up, and vinyl might be more like putting a softening filter on the image. They're inherently the same thing, but filtered differently. Uh, changing the frame rate drastically changes the character of what you're watching. It's not just a filter, it's watching something completely different. Now that I've covered some of the analogy conjectures of history, let's hit on some new high frame rate arguments that I have been getting. Argument number one, 24 FPS looks terrible whenever the camera pans. Now first I was gonna chalk this up to partly the toupee fallacy and partly people who don't know how to operate a camera because the pans that I shoot all look great in 24 FPS and the pans of every movie that I see are almost always very smooth and the instances where it isn't quite as smooth it's just the normal judder that comes with the territory of 24 FPS. To me, it's never been terrible. But then I had kind of a change of heart and it was all sparked by a monitor. I had plans on a video which required me to buy a 144 hertz monitor. Well, I got a cheap Acer XFA20 that had good reviews on Tom's hardware. It was only like 150 bucks, but it was my reception computer, which I don't use that much and didn't really think much of it. Then I started researching for this very video, watching stuff at 24 frames per second on that monitor. And I noticed something startling. Yes, a pan like this from the masterpiece Too Many Cooks looks terrible on this Acer 144 Hertz monitor. It stutters like crazy. More than just regular judders, things strobe as they slide across the screen. But when I drag the window to my side monitor at 60 Hertz, it looks fine. Ultimately, my tentative conclusion is it was this monitor. It's a terrible monitor for viewing pans. The problem just doesn't plague the cheap. High-end OLED TVs have the same issue. People who are perfectly happy with their plasma TVs displaying 24 FPS have taken to the forums and reported unbelievable amounts of stuttering in their brand new OLED TVs. It doesn't plague all sets, and frankly, I don't know enough about it right now to give you more answers, but if pans and movies look terrible, it could very well be that you're watching it on a monitor that's not capable of displaying it correctly. Now, this is becoming a serious issue as just this past August 2019, a consortium of filmmakers and TV manufacturers came together to create a standard for watching films on TVs called Filmmaker Mode. And we'll see how this plays out as it comes to screens in 2020. Now the next possible reason why 24 FPS might look bad is simply because it was terrible encoding. When you search intro to The Shining, this is the first clip that pops up with 730,000 views. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that looks like garbage. Something is seriously wrong with that encoding because this is what it's supposed to look like. And YouTube is full of this poorly encoded video. People ripping TV streams, 24 presented as 30 frames per second, bad deinterlacing, and strangely enough, soap operas are a huge culprit. On YouTube, General Hospital's promos are in the network standard of 60 frames per second, and they look correct. The clips from aired shows on YouTube get down converted to 24 and look insanely stuttery because there's no motion blur. And then if you go to the official site, all the clips there are what looks to be 30 frames per second. So the lesson is if it looks bad, it may either be your screen or the encoding. Argument number two, I saw a side-by-side -side comparison of 24 and 60 and the 60 FPS video looks so much better. Well, first I question how good your demonstration is because a lot of comparisons I see are done by amateurs who don't have a clue what they're doing, just like the shiny intro. But even when done properly, I always try to avoid showing frame rates side by side because yes, you will always prefer the higher frame rate precisely because it's smoother. But no one disagrees that the smoother image looks nice. What we're saying is a smoother image 
does not look like a movie. And at this point, I'm sure half the viewers are throwing up their hands in disgust. This guy is making no logical sense. Why would anyone prefer a less smooth image? So let me put it in a different way. Let's say I put out before you two glasses, one which I'm going to fill with a lovely Merlot and the other I'm going to fill with a lovely Welch's grape juice. Now I'm going to let you try each and ask you without any prejudices, which tastes better. I'm willing to bet that most people, especially if they have no experience with wine, will say that the grape juice tastes better for the very simple reason that the grape juice is sweeter. But people still want wine, even though side by side, it doesn't taste as good. Why? It has a character, it has obvious cultural history behind it, and of course, alcohol. But I'm not one to wax poetically on wine, nor am I one to cast aspersions on grape juice. It's delicious, but the thing is, it's not wine. Argument three, we should switch to 30 frames per second as a good compromise. This is not a negotiation. That's not, that's like taking my Merlot and dumping in grape juice. It's not Merlot anymore and it's not grape juice. It's something completely different. A grape cocktail, I guess. Seriously, there's no reason to compromise. We know what 30 frames per second looks like. I even shoot 30 frames per second when I'm working with live events because my robotic cameras aren't capable of shooting 24. The ones capable of 24 cost twice as much. And for live events, I don't need it to look like a movie. Then why don't we put the shoe on the other foot and tell gamers, hey, I know you like playing your CSGO at 144 hertz and higher, but let's compromise and you can play it at 30 frames per second. You get your head chewed off and rightly so. So telling filmmakers to compromise to bump up to 30 FPS when we want to shoot 24, same deal. And just to be clear, I'm not knocking 30. I mean, I like sangria and that's sort of a wine cocktail, but if you want to shoot 30, shoot 30. If you want to shoot 24, shoot 24. And the thing is Hollywood wants to make movies and TV shows in 24. Argument four, fine. Maybe 24 is okay for the theater experience, but you should never upload 24 FPS for YouTube. I get this every few months. The argument goes that most people are watching YouTube on 60 Hertz monitors. Well, I guess these commenters didn't see the official page on frame rates from YouTube, which states that they accept a wide variety of standard frame rates. It also hasn't stopped every single music video on YouTube from using 24 FPS. In fact, the top 10 most viewed videos on YouTube representing about 40 billion views all of them, except for two, are in 24 frames per second. The two that aren't, number four, Masha and the Bear, Recipe for Disaster, with 4.17 billion views, plays at 25 frames per second. It's a Russian cartoon, so that's to be expected. The other one, number five, with 3.73 billion views, Baby Shark Dance, is at 30 frames per second. Do, 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 do but every other video from Despacito to Katy Perry's Roar, Voice of a Generation, is 24 frames per second. So what's the rationale behind the idea that you shouldn't deliver 24 to YouTube? Argument number five, three, two pull down is a bad thing. Now this is where a wee bit of knowledge without context creates massive fallacies. I've explained that the three, two pull down several times on this channel, but a basic rundown is this. In order to fit 24 frames into 60 Hertz stream, what you have to do is duplicate the first frame three times and the second frame two times, then alternate three, two, three, two, and so on. Now people get really, really hung up on this. Like it's some affront to a mystical frame rate God, but three, two pull down is not that big a deal because it comes at you incredibly fast. Even though I said early, earlier that audio and visual works differently in our brains, I'm going to demonstrate this using sound because I really can't do it visually. I'm going to play two tones, a high pitch, which represents the first frame of the pull down and a low pitch, which represents the second frame. So if we were listening to a two frame per second video stream with a three, two pull down, the cadence would sound like this. 60% of the time you heard the high pitch and 40% of the time you heard the low pitch. 
but you can certainly make out the, as we say in jazz, the swing of it. Now let's crank that up from two frames a second to 24 frames a second. Here, the higher tone gets 50 milliseconds and the lower tone gets 33 milliseconds. Can you tell which tone gets more time just by listening to it? Compare that to the straight 24, where each high and low tone gets the same duration, 42 milliseconds. Can you hear the difference? It's incredibly slight. It's like I said, our hearing is not the same of our, as our sight. We actually hear better than we see. So to me, the three, two pull down is visually unnoticeable. It is after all the way I watched movies looped endlessly in the background while I played with my action figures on the couch as a kid. The three, two pull down is even ingrained in all our classic TV shows from I Love Lucy all the way to Friends, all shot on film at 24 frames per second and utilizing the three, two pull down for broadcast. And pull down isn't some mystical voodoo either. It happens naturally when you have one frame rate going against another. In fact, for fun, I like to mentally figure out pull down schemes for other frame rate combinations. Like how would you get 25 frames into 60 Hertz? You take the largest common denominator and divide each frame rate. So with five as our largest common factor, we need to take five frames and spread them out over 12 cycles. So we can use a three, two, three, two, two, Pull down. Yeah, I know, I'm a big nerd. Argument six, the problem with high frame rates is filmmakers just don't know how to use it yet. Hollywood filmmakers need to experiment more with technology and different frame rates. There are two problems with this argument. First is that we don't know how to shoot high frame rate. I have to remind people constantly that we have been working with high frame rates in the arena of broadcast television for 70 years. We broadcast the Super Bowls and the Olympics in high frame rate. Heck, I spent the first five, six years producing exclusively high frame rate 60i video. And secondly, the tech folks of Hollywood are ridiculously cutting edge. I mean, the Apple Watch penetration in Los Feliz is through the roof, people. Hollywood folks are not afraid of experimenting with technology, far from it. The thing is, and everybody who actually makes films knows this, you don't experiment on the show. You experiment when the stakes are low, but when there's millions of dollars riding on the line for a feature film, you gotta know what the hell you're doing. So filmmakers experiment with screen tests and shorts and everything gets tested from wardrobe to visual effects. Now, somewhere in there, I'm sure frame rate tests have been done. Maybe not so much anymore because we all know what high frame rates look like. But sometimes companies will produce test footage and make that available to the public. In 2016, Netflix released Meridian, a test short noir film that plays back at 60 FPS. If you want a nice heaping serving of soap opera effect, check it out on YouTube. This test footage was designed at Netflix not to be a cinematic movie, but a real test of the compression codex because it has a lot of traditionally difficult to compress visual aspects. Another perhaps more interesting publicly available test is Lucid Dreams of Gabriel from Disney's Research Hub in 2014, a couple years after The First Hobbit. This short film about a mother achieving immortality through her son, unconditional love, and the fluidity of time, attempts to blend 24 frames per second footage with 48 FPS footage and is viewable in that format on YouTube. The title gives away the conceit when we're in lucid dreams of Gabriel, we're in 48 frames per second. When we're in reality, we're in 24. But honestly, it doesn't really work because of the next point I'm about to make. Argument number seven, variable frame rates are the future. This is one I hear about more and more as people are coming to grips with the fact that high frame rate in cinema is pretty much dead. That we need to utilize variable frame rates for certain shots that need it. Ironically, shots that traditionally thought of as needing it, action scenes, actually look worse in high frame rate. Real variable frame rate video is simply a bad thing for professional motion picture applications. Certain phones utilize variable frame rates and it is murder to edit. 
Instead, what we can do is use a non-variable higher frame rate to encode lower frame rates. This is the show scan approach. Start with, let's say, 120 frames per second, then show the same frame twice, and you get 60 frames per second. Show the same frame three times, and you get 40 frames per second. Four times, 30 frames per second. Five times, you get 24 frames a second. If you really want to, you can use pull downs to get basically any frame rate that you want. Now, the problem with that is every time you deviate from 24 FPS, it stops looking like a movie. I think that's why nothing came of that lucid dreams of Gabriel. It demonstrated that a frame rate switch is not the artistic tool that people might want to think it is. When you go up, it really doesn't feel like we're more in reality. It feels like we're no longer watching film, but watching digital video. So instead of a sense of reality, changing the frame rate signifies a change in recording medium and maybe scale. And there's one show that really did it brilliantly, and I think it's one that is highly underrated, The Larry Sanders Show. The Larry Sanders Show is about a late night talk show host and the antics of his life and office that ran on HBO in the 1990s. And it's kind of the precursor to an influencer of every other single camera, no laugh track comedy that followed. Whenever they depicted the world around Larry Sanders, it was shown in 24 frames per second. Whenever we see Larry Sanders on his talk show, it was shown in 60i. You can still see this effect for yourself in the official trailer as it bounces between 24 and de-interlaced 30 for modern progressive screens. And of course, for the YouTube generation, there's Video Game High School. Unfortunately for all the hullabaloo about it shooting 48 frames per second for the in-game scenes and 24 for the non-game reality scenes, it's only available in 24 frames per second on their official site and on YouTube. So changing the frame rate can work in those specific stories where you want to invoke a medium switch. But if you change it in the middle of a movie, it just feels like you're no longer in that movie. You're drinking wine and occasionally getting a sip of grape juice. Argument number eight, high frame rates can't make actors' performances look worse. Haven't you ever seen live theater? I got a bunch of these comments on my review of Gemini Man, which many people were particularly prickly about my issue with a Russian actor's accent becoming less believable in high frame rate version than in the 24 version. And the reason why acting suffers in high frame rate is because the cinematic veneer that comes with 24 is lost. I will get into a biological theory about why that veneer exists in a future episode, but with 24, we starve the viewer of just enough visual information so the imagination is allowed to kick in and fill in the details. With higher frame rates, this phenomenon doesn't happen, and we're left with the cold, harsh reality that we are literally watching an actor recite lines on a studio set. And yes, that extends to accents because the Russian actor was still playing a part and he was probably exaggerating his accent for the camera. With Gemini Man, I could go with the good guys because Will Smith, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and Benedict Wong were pretty much being themselves. But the bad guys, they had to put on an act. I bet Clive Owen is a good guy in real life, but in the movie, he needs to be a villain. And in high frame rate, you can see every hair of his mustache twirling. It spoils the illusion. Now, Vulture ran an article where a reviewer did the exact same thing that I did, but in reverse, watching the 24 version first and the HFR version second, and he had the same reaction, that the acting was weaker in the higher frame rate version. In another Vulture article, HGTV pioneer David Niles was quoted, we would take a scene between a couple of actors, shoot it at 60 frames per second, or even 30 frames, and then shoot it at 24, and put it in front of audiences to see how they would interpret it. With 24 frames, people liked the actors better. They felt the performances were better. In reality, it was exactly the same thing. Then the argument goes, well, John, I guess you've never been to a live theater where there's an infinite frame rate. To which I retort, I guess you don't know anything about live theater. Now, first of all, when you go to a theater, you get one seat and one viewing angle. The entire show happens in front of you from one vantage point. And even if you shell out the big bucks for the orchestra seats, you're still a good distance from the actors. You never get to see them in a close-up, filling up a 50-foot screen. There's no multiple cuts, no dissolves. The theater and the cinema have almost nothing in common visually. Next, and perhaps more importantly, theater is a medium of the imagination. 
You can watch a show where they put out four chairs and the actors pantomime the motion of driving a car. And it's acceptable. Theater sets tend to play more on abstract. One of my favorite theater recordings is the great performances recording of the 2006 second Broadway revival of Stephen Sondheim's Company. The whole play is staged on this minimalist set with few props and the actors performing their own accompaniment. It's as stripped down as you can get, and it's wonderful. The point is you're invited to play along, to be in the moment with the performers, which you know are performers. Cinema, generally speaking, goes for a different realistic magic trick. Argument number nine. Well, if the 24 cinematic veneer just covers up a lot of mistakes, that just means Hollywood needs to stop being so lazy and learn to act better and build better sets. I really hate this argument. First, it's clear that the person making the argument has never ever made a movie. And when I challenged someone who said this to actually make a movie, any movie, that person just threw up a bunch of excuses at why they weren't capable of making a movie. Didn't have enough money, didn't have the equipment, don't have the actors. Well, guess what, Hotshot? Even professional movie makers have to put up with these very same problems. There's always some restriction somewhere that's preventing filmmakers from making their visions, regardless of what level of filmmaking you're working in. So to begin with, filmmaking is hard already. And if you manage to get the money, get the sets, get the cast, get the crews, you're spending 12 hour days average trying to capture what you want. And lots of things are working against you. Landing a perfect shot requires coordination from a lot of different departments. This whole notion that Hollywood filmmakers are lazy building cheap sets is just ignorance. Which brings me to the real reason why this statement is so offensive. Movie making is not rocket surgery. It's art, damn it. Reality is not the goal of filmmaking. That's why we have things like lights and stages and blocking. The purpose of cinema is to transcend reality, not to simply depict it. To take a small side trip, there's a great little interview with French director Jean Renoir, who talks about how technology can ruin art. He does say that this is a conversational thought that must not be taken and carried to the extreme, but the notion is a fascinating one. When the technique is primitive, everything is beautiful. And when the technique is perfected, almost everything is ugly, except things created by artists who are ingenious enough to overcome the technique. We treasure every single film made during the proto-film era, and we push a button to skip the ad that costs modern advertisers millions of dollars to create. When photography was rare, it was treasured. Now the supermarket bulletins filled with carefully crafted photos line the bottom of our pets' cages. High frame rate is this movement toward the vulgar realism. Yes, it can look great, but it lacks character. Renoir's words led me to think that if we want to find more art and more beauty, the solution is to run away from realism, not toward it. This is not an unfamiliar tack to follow in the history of art in the 20th century. Movies are a magic trick. They are supposed to be an illusion. What you are seeing isn't real. And all high frame rate does is reinforce that fact. Myth number 10, you're just used to 24 FPS. Being used to something is not a good justification for its existence. I'm also used to reading English from left to right. Other languages write from right to left, and in Chinese they even write from up to down. There's no movement to change the way we write English. Cultural legacies are very powerful things. Of course, not all customs are born equal, but to dismiss and destroy something without understanding why it is so important culturally is simply barbaric. And to be fair, a lot of the anti-24 FPS crap that I've been seeing is pretty barbaric and stupid. I think the internet culture of today has a bit too much hubris in our technological and scientific understanding. We think we have mastered everything because we can Google it but I just spent the last 5,000 words hopefully showing that the common arguments against something as frivolous as frame rate are still so amazingly shallow. There is still so much more beyond what I've covered that to pretend that you have it all figured out to the point where you can just dictate how filmmakers ought to create their own art, that's just flat out bull. High frame rate. I get that every generation wants to overthrow the past, but I also get that every generation is 
naive and clueless. The kids are always stupid. The old people are always out of touch. The irony is how the same person transitions between the two extremes. And the hubris comes from thinking that you won't too. In my defense of 24 FPS, I flippantly dismiss the it's only because you're used to it argument by retorting, well, maybe you only dislike it because you're not used to it. I guess my economy of words masks the profoundness of the statement for some. Maybe if you don't like 24 FPS, you simply don't like cinema. And that's fine. You don't have to like it. And there's no reason we filmmakers need to cater to people who don't like cinema. Now that I've run down the clock with excessive straw man beating, I will end by repeating the challenge that I have not seen a single person take up. If you believe the high frame rate to be the future, go out and make that change yourself. Make a short narrative film with actors and a real script. Put the time and effort into it. I've done it myself several times and I've done it in non 24 frame rates. I know if you're serious about the craft of filmmaking, you're going to make the film and realize it doesn't look right. Something is missing until you add back in that 24 frames per second. Then at least you're speaking the cinematic language, maybe not perfectly fluently, but you're part way there. 24 frames per second is not the only element to making a film look like a film by any stretch of the imagination, but it's one of the key ingredients. And if you would disagree with that, you have no fucking clue what you're talking about. And there you have it. I hope you've enjoyed this exhausting tour of cinema through the lens of frame rates. I've created a lot of videos on the various aspects of the cinematic history that we covered, which I will link in the description along with links to many of the videos that I just discussed. Like, subscribe, check out our Patreon so I can hopefully cover other new topics related to filmmaking that don't involve the words frame and rate. And get yourself your own live in life 24 frames per second t-shirt or hoodie in the merch shelf below. You'll need them as protection if you dare journey into the comment section below. Go out there and make something great. I'm John Hess, I'll see you at Filmmaker IQ. Filmmaker IQ.